speaking to a few of the slides and he is not here. I expect him to be here. I, I talked to him not long ago. So uh, is he in the attendees by mistakes? Uh, so I see Sonny now, so they must be coming up. Okay. Well, let's start the recording and I can do the introductory stuff. And So this meeting's now being recorded. It will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel by our IT department. Kathy, I'm going to go ahead and make you the host. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. This is uh, the Net Zero Subcommittee of the Elementary School Building Committee. Uh, it is Tuesday, March 29th. Um, and I'm gonna call the, uh, the meeting to order and make sure that all my subcommittee members can be seen and be heard. Um, and I'm just gonna go in the order of folks that I see them on the screen. So I'm gonna call on Kathy first. Yes, I'm here. And then uh, Ben. I am also here. And Rupert? Yes, I'm here. And I can see we have Sean, who's also on our building committee meeting, uh, member. <laughs> he's a building committee member. Uh, and since he's here, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him to identify himself. I can hear and, and be heard. Um, I don't think I'm technically part of this. Formally part yeah, of it. Yeah, kind of good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn to Tim and say, do you have all your folks that we're gonna present uh, here or should we pause another uh, minute? I do not see Steve Coffrin, but um, he is not going to present. He's going to be available for questions related to PV. So uh, I think we can start okay. and hope he joins. I will turn things over to you. Great. Uh, it's good to be here. I just want to say that we have the team, Simone from BAP, uh, Function and Sunny from Thornton Tom City. We're going to go through um, a brief. Well, maybe not so brief presentation, um, and then uh, get to a discussion with some questions and answers. Uh, with that, I will share my screen. Are you able to see, or do you see black? I see black and. I, I see yeah. it clearly. Yep, we can see okay. your slides. Excellent. Okay, uh, so we're going to be talking about life cycle cost analysis and projected expenses, capital costs and operating costs for air source versus ground source heating system and new construction and renovation addition today. Um, just as background, um, the assumptions that we've made and the geometry that we are using to do these projections are the options that were submitted as part of the PDP. Um, we have just begun meeting last week to design the actual building with the approved program, met with Mike and some of the school staff. And as we move forward and have an actual building footprint and building massing, um, you know, all of these projections will be refined and revised to reflect that building design. But what we are talking about now are assumptions that we have made up to the PDP and moving forward. Um, that is not to say that we are not already beginning to see information revealed and trends that uh, are beginning to show differences between the different um, heating sources and or mechanical systems, I should say, and um, construction approaches. So the, the, you know, to review the difference between, or some of the major differences between um, a renovation addition and new construction will be the ratio of envelope to the amount of conditioned volume in the building, which will have uh, an effect on operating costs and building performance going forward. Um, another difference between will be the amount of roof area, which will then inform how much PV will be um, accommodated on the roof. With a smaller building footprint for a new building, um, less PV can be accommodated on the roof and more will have to be supported on the ground. Um, I should note that one of the questions asked 
uh, that has been passed along to us is why the footprint of the building is not roughly one third of the total area of the building for the three story version. Um, and, and that's due to a lot of factors. Um, some of which are some of the spaces like the gym have uh, are required to be a little bit taller than other spaces so they take up spaces on multiple floors and therefore things don't get distributed evenly also um, just the adjacencies of the program elements within the building you can't always evenly distribute them between three floors so those are all factors that lead to the footprint of the building not being one third and then when we do arrive at a building footprint, we will know how much PV we can accommodate on the roof and how much we can accommodate on the site with canopy mounted solar. Um, and that distinction is important because as we get into the different types of systems, the total amount of PV required will be different. So um, all of these different factors that I'm talking about are going to in various ways affect the numbers that we talk about as we move forward. Um, so those are the baseline assumptions on the geometry and the options that we are talking about at this point. And now we're going to move into the systems and projections of operating costs, capital costs. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Fong Shi. And sunny. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, no, um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And I was so we, Sunny and I will just tag team to go through some of this information. Um, at the risk of you know preaching to the choir here, we are going to be looking at life cycle cost analysis as a you know long term uh, impact of ownership of these systems. So we are trying to, there are a lot of assumptions that go into it. Um, so we, you know, we summarize it, there are more details behind this, but we'll just uh, talk about the high level input parameters and the outputs. And I believe like most of the committee members have already seen this data and there are some questions. So we'll address them at the end of the um, summary here. Um, with that, Sunny, do you wanna take on these um, quick input assumptions just to walk through quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for so as um, Tim said, we studied two geometries. One is for the rental, one is for the new construction. And uh, for both geometries, um, the envelope are assumed to uh, have the same attributes. That is, um, they have the same window to wall ratio at 23% and uh, same level of insulation in roof and wall. And, uh, and also for the internal loads, uh, we're assuming 0.55. Uh, watts per square foot, which is typical for um, new schools with LED lighting and a plug load of 0.6 watts per square foot. Um, and they're same for both schools. And um, this is the operational schedule we assumed, uh, which is come from the school. And um, there's the school year and uh, summer, and it's different for each space type that we separated. And uh, so for two geometries, we also have two HVAC uh, options. One is the air source heat pump. And for air source heat pump, uh, we have ducted fan coil units for classroom and offices and uh, energy recovery unit for ventilation for these spaces. And for the rest of the bigger assembly spaces, um, there are their uh, air source heat pump uh, age use for these places. And for uh, kitchen, there is the makeup air unit with uh, electric heat um, backup and uh, heat air source heat pump too. And similarly for the um, ground source heat pump option, we have uh, active chill beams for the classrooms and uh, energy recovery unit for ventilation again, and um, all other bigger spaces have their delicate uh, air handling units and geothermal, um, the ground source heat pump will provide hot water and chill water to these units. Take that 
Can go next. Funny. This is um, a snapshot of the four options that we had, um, the ad reno options and the uh, new construction. Um, and with the, the two systems that we just talked about, air source pump and the GSX team. Um, so uh, what you're looking at is the EY is on the top of those bar charts for each of the options and the black line actually indicates the required amount of PV system or the PV service to offset um, all the energy used on the site itself. Now, one key thing to note here is if you look at the Renault option with ASHP versus uh, new construction with ASHP, the difference is not a whole lot. It's a very minor difference in the EY. And the reason is um, we are assuming for the Renault option, we'll bring up the envelope to the same standard as a new construction. So essentially we are reskinning and so that the thermal envelope is gonna be exactly the same. So essentially, if you are comparing um, whether it's a Renault option versus uh, new construction, uh, the difference in the systems types is gonna be give or take about the same. Uh, so with, um, the air source heat pump option, we are in the range of 31, 31.4, 31.5 EY. And uh, for the geothermal system, uh, ground source heat pump system, we are 24.9 and 25.3 respectively. Uh, let's move to the next one, Tim. So these are some of the capital cost uh, information that we assumed. On the left side table, you see the capital cost of um, HVAC system, geothermal wells, and also the um, photovoltaic system cost. And also we included the mass save incentive uh, for each of these options. As you can see, the air source heat pump has a little bit or have the incentives that is available than a ground source heat pump. Um, because it's based on the EY that we can achieve for each of these options. And on the right side, um, we have replacement costs for HVAC system and also the photovoltaic system. Um, again, these costs that we are looking at is for the life cycle of the building, which is 50 years. So we have these replacements happening at different point in time in the life of the building. Uh, just to give you a little quick um, snapshot, visual snapshot, we have created a chart just showing that. So what this is showing is the GSHP option, which is the blue or the teal line, and uh, the orange is the ASHP uh, option. So the replacements are happening at different time of the system's life. Um, as you can see, they're not exactly overlapping, and some systems may need to be replaced uh, more often than the others because of the nature of the systems themselves. Um, one more thing I'd like to point out here is for the purposes of this life cycle cost analysis, the, um, we assume the utility costs are going to be zero because we'll be negating with the photovoltaic system. Um, again, this is not exactly what you will see there are meter charges and those kind of for the infrastructure that you have to still pay um, but from energy cost perspective that's how we presented it and obviously we can adjust depending on how people want to see this data so the gist of this is if you look at the right side of the chart um, the life cycle cost of each of these options are within within you know half a million to um yeah about half a million within each other um which is which is good case for geothermal system as well uh, ground source heat pumps system as well um but there are other factors that play into it uh, and we can discuss those things um, i wonder if it might be good to just kind of touch on on what's happening at those uh kind of milestones you know what what is uh, ground source heat 
pump replacement one and two um because I, I think my suspicion is you'll you'll uh answer some questions before they're asked if you if you touch on that yep i would also simon is online too right i'll have simon also chime in here so we based on our internal discussion within the design team members here we um talked about 50 percent of uh, capital cost replacement for air source heat pump at uh, year 16. And at year um, 31, we expect 80% of the cost of replacement. And, and this is gonna repeat after that and in the year 46 for the air source heat pump, or 41, sorry. Um, and for geothermal system, we anticipate similar kind of schedule, but a little bit more stretched out, one around 21 year and one 41 years. Um, as for the exact systems, what will be replaced? Simon, if you're online, could you speak to that? What kind of systems would be replaced? Yeah, for both uh, air source and ground source, uh, first cycle, life cycle, most likely replacement is not wholesale replacement, how, but it'll be like compressor replacement, some of the fan and motor replacement. So we estimated to about 50% about of the capital cost versus the second round. Uh, most likely it would be almost wholesale replacement with the exception of some of the piping and ductwork distribution that's already in there. And Samoon, for the, for the ground source, the wells themselves, what's you're not replacing those at the 80% line. The wells are good for, for longer or, or not? Just, just some clarity. Uh, there is a, a no varying problem. predictions actually from what I, uh, available documents says anywhere from 30 to 40 years. Yeah, and, and I just wanna add that GCA or other consultant on geothermal said that it's not uncommon for the components of the wells themselves, not the distribution system, but the HDPE, the lines that are in there, you could get a warranty for up to 50 years. So this calculation does not assume a replacement of the wells themselves, but the plumps, the circulation, stuff like that above ground is replaced in the lifetime of the building. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just a very simple summary of uh, what we have uh, for the different options. Um, EUIs that we already looked at, annual electric city use. Again, this is before photovoltaic system. And the same thing with annual carbon dioxide emissions. Again, our idea is that the net emissions would be zero once the PV systems are uh, accounted for. But just to give us, you know, how much the building itself is going to be generating and how much we'll be, we will have to offset it. Um, again, from our perspective, the idea is to make these numbers, the emissions as small as possible. So ultimately, the photovoltaic system is also reduced the size of it. Um, and then we also have the 50 years electricity use for each of those options as well. The next one. Um, so this is what I was alluding to earlier about, you know, the utility cost is not necessarily exactly going to be zero, um, uh, but you still have to pay for the infrastructure and other things. Um, I don't know if, um, Tim, you want to add more to that costs that are showing up on our options compared to the existing utilities? We just lost it, Tim. Just, yeah, the slide. There you go. There you go. Sure. Um, the system, the PV system is going to be designed to offset all of the energy use of the building. Um, you know, so theoretically, every kilowatt hour used will be produced either at that time or some other time, and then there will be a bill of credit from the utility. Um, but as Bamshi alluded to, there are metering charges, uh, there are peaks um, that have to be accounted for in terms of maximum usage. Um, there is also a schedule that was used to assume the design and this life cycle operating cost that was a few slides ago. If um, 
the building is used outside of those design parameters, you could exceed the amount of energy um, produced on site. Um, so uh, it would it would not be totally accurate to say that the energy bill, the electricity cost is going to go to zero. This assumes 95%. Um, we have done the solar design a hour by hour comparison based on the assumption so far, and they predict a slightly higher, uh, but we, we tend to be conservative. Um, so this this is where we are right now until we get um, you know more detailed and refined designs to analyze. Um, the other columns in this slide that we should talk about are the natural gas and oil costs that are associated with the current schools while we're in Fort River. Um, this will be an all electric building. So those will go away, uh, save for the cost to maintain an emergency generator, uh, which would be natural gas on the Fort River site or um, most likely oil burning on the Wildwood site. Um, and so generators do have to be run periodically to make sure that they run when you need them. Um, but that is a very small portion of the cost of the natural gas or oil that is used for heating at the existing schools. So what this slide in total is showing, the operating cost in terms of utility bills, um, you're going roughly from 250000 to 10000 a year with these schemes. Granted, some of the as shown in previous slide, options, air source versus ground source use more electricity than others. Um, so if you were paying for it, there would be more savings, but they're all gonna be offset by the different size PV array that will be built as associated with the project, which brings them close to each other at the end. Um, And then one more thing to circle back on, which uh, we just briefly mentioned before, there is um, incentives as part of Eversource uh, that will contribute to the project and offset some of the capital costs that will allow you to realize these savings. Um, we have already started discussions with Eversource and those incentives might be getting a little bit more generous, but we can't really count on that yet, but they they should be in the very near future. And then there's also a, a smart program with the state that will help offset the cost of the PV and other capital investment that the project will have to make to realize these energy and use savings. Jonathan. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. We lost. I, I just, Jonathan, if yep. we could stand this, I just have a, a question. It's more for the future, Tim, but mm -hmm. underlying the electricity costs for the schools, I believe we can get kilowatt hours, you know, on a, it's a cents per hour. So will it, for the future, if we could, we, can we do a, what the cost would be in 2026? Of we, if we can continue to operate the schools using kilowatt hours, and then also compare the kilowatt hours we use now with the building even before you've done the offset. Because my understanding is this building, we've got a sieve for a building right now with no insulation. Um, so we're probably using a lot more electricity than we need to use just because of it not having a good envelope and all the other things. So I think it just would be good for us to have later in a fact sheet if we can mm -hmm. do the expected kilowatt use in the new building compared to kilowatt use if we continue to operate these two. So you will be able to do that for us, right? Once if we, we can get you the kilowatt hour numbers. Uh, we, we do have the, um, sorry, I keep trying to unmute and I lose the, uh, I lose the slide. Um, we do have the current usage for actually the whole district and those numbers and the current average kilowatt hour rate that you're paying is what was used to generate these numbers. But uh, absolutely what you're saying would provide more context in terms of uh, maintaining the current uh, status quo and what that would mean. Uh, we can do that analysis to show you what the real savings are. Uh, it was also mentioned in some of the questions that 
you know, we're sort of comparing the existing building um, to the building that is required by the net zero energy bylaw. And there are some meaningful informative comparisons um, that would also give further context to these numbers. Um, basically a building that would meet the MSBA funding requirements in terms of performance, but not your bylaw and the amount of savings that you would not um, the difference in illustration I'm trying to say of what this investment will save you in terms of operating costs going forward. So we, we can provide those examples and comparisons going forward. So Tim, if you, if you finish the, the sort of formal presentation, I'd like to open it up to questions from the, the subcommittee and then we'll we'll move on to questions that, that we've gotten from um, from public members. Remember Absolutely. That. I will stop sharing. So uh, do we have additional questions from, from the subcommittee? Uh, Rupert and then Kathy. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, in terms of the life cycle cost analysis, uh, I assume that that does not make any assumptions about inflation. Uh, so my question is uh, with the different time periods for the different systems, um, is the effect of inflation uh, going to be stronger on uh, the system that, that uh, costs more later instead of more earlier? Uh, I'm sure you want to answer that and then I yeah, can ask. Yeah, I mean, currently in our analysis, we did take into account inflation, but these were the standard inflation rates that are published by uh, FEMP. Um, but obviously, as we all know, that the inflation rate right now is nowhere close to that standard rates. Um, we need to take a look at it and see how that impacts, um, see if it's going to be any different for one system versus the other. Um, we need to do a little bit of digging so we can get back to you on that. But it's a really good question. I'll make a note of that. Kathy? I have. Um a few questions and they're slightly different topics. So maybe I'll just rattle them off. Um, the first is um, for the consultants. I know you've worked with other schools, not just necessarily the Donesco schools. And to the extent we've got examples in Massachusetts, Donesco and other schools or other places that have either have made one of these other two choices, either ground source or air source. Would you be able to get us there after the building opens experience? So I'm interested in not just cost performance, but also uh, what the building feels like, noise, um, air ambience. Um, so, so from a not theoretical, but what actually happened once it's opened and I see Shelley Hot offers here. Um, she's with an answer. So I don't need an answer right now, but I just think some of that would be helpful for us as we consider not just the price tag, um, but the actual experience. So that's my question. Should I do each of them first, Jonathan, and then let them answer? Um, yeah. Okay. So my second question is um, I know on your first slide, Tim, you said any of our options would, the roof would not be enough for PV. So do you have a rough, does um, with a three-story building or ad reno, is it about 50% um, and does it make a difference if our new was two stories rather than three stories? So that sort of, cause I, I'm, I think canopies are more expensive than roof mounted. So just, so that was my PV question. Um, then my third is if it went air source, um, I think you said that the ground source heat pumps would provide the hot water. Um, there are ground source hot water heaters that are hot water pumps that I think could be coupled with air source. So um, I don't know what's assumed for how we're heating the water. Our house put in a ground source hot water heater. Um, so that's not pure electric hot water heater. So I didn't know what you'd assumed was heating the water in the air source building. Um, 
and I think that's it. The one other one is more construction time. Um, and this is uh, for the larger committee. If we go ground source, does it mean the number of months that were spent in construction is longer because we have to put the wells in or can some of it happen simultaneously? Is there any impact on the duration of construction with one version versus another? That's my... I, I can answer the PV and the construction schedule question, then I'll hand it off to Simone and Famshi for the second part. Uh, for the PV, uh, you're correct that we're not going to get the entire array on the roof um, based on the two options that have been modeled so far. Um, just under half, maybe 45%, was on the roof of the uh, renovation addition just because it has more roof area. And the other one was uh, closer to 30% on the roof. And you are right, there is a cost difference. The, what we're using at this stage is 225 uh, watt installed on a roof and three dollars for canopy mounted um, so the more that you can get on the roof the better um, i will say that we're sort of conservative with the amount of pv that you can get on the roof just because uh, a lot of things that you do on the roof control how much you can put up there one there's equipment that takes up space uh, there is a possibility to put racks above the equipment but that comes with a cost that pushes it closer to the canopy price per watt. Um, another thing is simply that parts of the building are probably taller than the others. There are stairs, it goes to the roofs, there may be a gym, and the shadow of some of the building makes some of the other parts of the building um, not, uh, not good for solar. Um, so yeah, you have identified all the variables in the equation of uh, how much we can fit on the roof and what the total cost will be in terms of you know maximizing what we put on the roof and the rest has to go on the site and you know just to add to that the air source with its higher electricity demands will require more total pv which will also probably mean that more slide to the site because a lower percentage will get on the roof um, and then for the construction schedule uh the well drilling can be concurrent with the other activities that will happen. Uh, I mean, it, it is a process that takes time that has to be scheduled, but it will not have an impact um, with the options. And the impact between new construction and phase renovation is much greater than, so those are, those are, those are that's the big difference between the two different schedule lengths. Um, and then Simone, can you speak to that I'm gonna, yeah, I will start then uh, I want to let uh, Vamshi uh, also finish it up to see what he actually used. In both air source and geothermal system, domestic hot water production, you can't quite make it hot enough. So you have to use it as a preheating uh, as a system. Then you do the final trimming uh, with electric resistance heat. In the case of air source heat pump system, uh, Payback is longer because you're buying this equipment that is heating and cooling and you're only utilizing for the heating purpose only. So uh, return on investment is much longer. Yeah, I was going to add to that same question, um, the same question that in our model, obviously domestic hot water is a very small piece of the pie. Um, we are talking about uh, anywhere from 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 EY. Um, it's uh, it's not a big amount, but at, at the same time, you know, as a design team, we are always trying to find means to reduce wherever we have chance and opportunity to reduce the load. Um, currently, the efficiency wise, we assume the same for both of them, um, uh, for domestic hot water or the service hot water, I guess. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep plugging away. I mean, our focus has been primarily on the mechanical system, the HVAC system here. Um, and the question that your first question, Kathy, that was about the actual experience of the systems um, will, I mean, we are also always interested. I mean, obviously we are looking at the performance of, of the systems, but also it would be great to get some feedback on their actual experience of the space, the comfort, and then they have any issues 
which we haven't really done, gone back to these schools and done it. Um, there are not as many schools which are zero net energy and have same system. Um, but there is one about done and a couple of them about done. So I'll reach out to them and see if I can get some somebody to speak to that. And, uh, um, no, and, and I was particularly with or, well, with or without the PV, but the interest of going ground source versus air right. source, for the experience and um, and I don't either within the world that you've operated in, I know there are, um, when I read some of the literature, Virginia has some schools that have ground source. I just don't, I don't know what's the easiest to get, but I think it would be useful for us to know about in helping us make a decision. I, I, if I could just kind of touch on, on part of that, um, I think it would be useful for us to understand at some point, whether it's today or not, um, what the what the experience of the the teacher and the and the students in a class in an average classroom would be um, with the ground source versus the air source when it comes to ambient noise or or you know the the sensibility that you know physical sensation of getting warm between the two systems or getting cool for that matter because um, that 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 may have a bearing on, on how people view the systems. Yeah. Yeah, and and we do have several schools which have geothermal systems and air source heat pumps. Not necessarily all of them are zero net energy schools. Um, but let me tr try to find out uh, any contacts, and maybe I can just put in touch with uh, with the committee here. Yeah, I think I think it's um, helpful for for all of us to kind of reach out and kind of do a post occupancy evaluation. Which is what I think, Kathy, you're you're asking, and, and Jonathan really, um, and that should occur actually if if they're lead projects, um, they're supposed to do that. I think for a, a design credit or something like that. So so we have a few that um, we have one that uses ground source and air chill beams, and the other one is uh, air source utilizing VRF. So we can certainly do that. And Shelly's on the call. Maybe Shelly has some contacts as well. Um, the interesting part would be in, they might not know what to compare it to, right? <laughs> and so, and so what, you know, we, we could, we could ask, um, Allison or, or any of the principals within your district and they're going to have a before and an after and they're going to say, oh my God, it like we actually get air, we actually get heat. <laughs> so sometimes it's a little hard to quantify that, um, but we can certainly try, try to pose a question in a way that we get some, some helpful responses. Thank you. Rupert? Thank you. Yes. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on the between the two uh, systems, ground source and air source, any uh, differences in relative complexity. And also, I'm curious about um, uh, non uh, energy operating expenses, uh, additional training for personnel, uh, regular annual uh, preventive maintenance, recalibration, sensor replacement. If there's, if you foresee any difference between the two systems, thank you. Yeah, I mean, in geothermal system, basically aside from the geothermal plant itself, everything downstream is uh, literally full pipe system that's been around for 40, 50 years. So, uh, regardless how complex it is, it's very familiar thing that all the contractors are familiar with, and. It's time proven system, nothing fancy about it. And it's very robust system. So, uh, however, uh, VRF system or air source heat pump system is all the, most of the energy is distributed by refrigerant system and it's a little complex. So uh, about let's say half of the uh, contractors are familiar with it, but not all of them are familiar with it yet. I think it will change after time, but it's a lot more complex. Shelly? Yeah, I would just add to the questions back to schools that have one or the other. And I would ask the facilities managers what their experience is, because that's, I think, I completely agree. You want to know what the experience is in the classroom. 
but you also need to know what the facility manager's experience is and to get some real feedback from some actual places that would help, I think, to make these decisions. Yeah, uh, we would agree. And I think for us, the challenge is both of these schools uh, became occupied right before COVID. And so yeah, they really haven't even had a full year cycle um, since the students have been back. And that, you know, that goes to from, you know, how well does the, um, how well was our energy model? How, how does the energy model stack up? Because we don't really have a full year of data as, as well as the use of the system, um, you know, going from, we just haven't really experienced both shoulder seasons yet. So it, it's a little hard, but we can certainly reach out to see what um, their experiences are to date. Shelly, do you have another comment or yeah. question? I, I do, another question, it's unrelated, but um, back to the building envelope, just I wanna make sure um, everyone understands what, what complexities might be presented with the renovation in regards to the slab. So I'm wondering what's in the model for the under slab insulation and what, uh, particularly for the renovation, is the plan to get the existing slab up to the same level as new or with something different um, placed in the model for that. So just curious about that. Uh, that's a good question. I can touch on that. Uh, so in the model, we assumed um, same insulation for both cases, which means the renovation will have uh, slab insulation as well. Well, just to clarify that, you know, you know obviously you can't remove the slab. Um, from the existing, it's not it's going to be cost prohibitive, but primarily the slab insulation. Um, we'll, what we are looking for is perimeter heat losses because when the slab is sitting on the foundation, you know that's the weak weak link there. So the two 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 aspects um, to consider. One is that perimeter heat losses and whether we are insulating above grade from inside to outside. Um, so the first part is you know. Essentially, if you are trying to attain the same level of in, uh, insulation in the existing, you could do perimeter insulation on the outside. It will require a little bit of digging outside and then just insulating it. Um, and the other piece um, about grade insulation, we obviously uh, really prefer to do a continuous insulation because that's where you get most of your thermal performance not um, you won't have many thermal bridging issues um which i'm supposing is how we are going in this in that direction the only challenges challenges uh, the challenge that we would face about grade if we are trying to insulate from inside we want to pay close attention to the condensation point to ensure like you know we are not uh, insulating overly and creating some moisture <laughs> issues but those things we are getting into details but you know we can figure that out as the design progresses but then there are ways to bring the envelope to pretty much the same level as the new construction but just to, to recap for clarity um in the new construction uh, because it'd be required by code and would be good practice you would be uh, providing uh, continuous under slap insulation is that is that correct tim and all and the rest of the team uh, continuous under slab is not. actually is not required by code. It, you need two feet from the perimeter. Um, depending on what we need to get the performance, we could consider it, but uh, we would certainly prefer hiding an envelope that is going to get the building to perform um, the way it needs to to meet these energy targets. Yeah, the only time we do, re you know have the insulation under the entire slab is where we have radiant systems uh, because you have much higher temperature slab and then the ground temperature but if you do not have that which in this case we're not looking at any radiant systems um, as tim has mentioned you know just have the perimeter is fine because your ground pretty much remains consistent throughout the year in the middle middle of the uh, floor plate if you will 
Okay. The the other thing we would not be getting um, at the slab level uh, for renovation uh, would be a, a vapor barrier under the slabs. And in a new construction, we would have that. And and that has actually been an issue in, in our schools is that they, they don't have a proper air barrier or excuse me, air barrier or vapor barrier under the slabs. Um, that That is true. Um, it, it, it would be expensive to remove the whole slab. We would probably selectively have to take some out and we could talk about how we do the details, but there are um, uh, surface supply moisture mitigation systems that are effective moisture barriers. But I mean, you, you were absolutely correct. You could not get a continuous um, under slab vapor barrier, which, which is the ideal. I think we would want to make sure that we're including that surface applied uh, system, at least cost wise going forward. It's probably not a significant cost, but given we've had problems with moisture in our slabs, it's kind of a off the topic conversation, but. Well, no, but I th it is off the topic on the net zero, Jonathan, but I think when we're, when we're comparing our options, right. uh, the, the risk of moisture, the risk of other things not being fully addressed, you know, cannot be completely addressed. I mean, Tim had said with the ad reno, he, if it was the Fort River site, they're going to raise the foundation up for the new, but they wouldn't be raising it up for the old. So I just think we need to have that kind of list um, when we're looking at these, yeah. Nope. And we can provide that and that level of detail will be informative for making the decision between the sites, absolutely. Uh, other questions from the subcommittee? Not seeing any. Uh, I think we could probably move on to um, uh, to public comments, um, although I don't know if Tim, you'd like to kind of walk through some of the comments you've gotten already. Um, that so, might speed up our public comment. I yeah. should also probably note one thing um, or ask you to clarify one thing before I have you take on those closed questions, which is, are, are you looking for the subcommittee today to be putting forward a, a, a recommendation, which is kind of point five on our agenda. If we don't have to do that, I think folks would probably feel more comfortable. We are not. Uh, to, that's the short answer. Now, let me give a bit more uh, in-depth answer. Uh, short answer, no. Um, so as I said at the top, you know, all of our assumptions and modeling are based on, um, you know, what we submitted at the PDP, and we are continuing to refine our assumptions, our design, and that will in turn uh, refine our projections. But what we are looking to do is uh, develop a basis of design that will be part of the PSR, um, which is going to be submitted in June. Uh, the documents are going to be costed in May. Um, so as we move towards those goals, we want to have a discussion to make sure that we have a level of confidence um, that we are providing the information that you need to make a decision headed up to those milestones. Uh, it doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be the next meeting. It just has to be a tailored to get to that point in June so we can comfortably move forward from there. The final cost and design of the system is not really till the end of the year, but it, it's going to make the entire process a lot more efficient um, if we can come to decisions on some of these major um, um, variables uh, at, with the PSR in June. Yeah, just to add to that, um, Jonathan, um, the, schema the preferred schematic report is we identify what the um, Amherst preferred solution is. And with that comes a dollar amount, right? It's still, it's still um, preliminary. It, it will be more refined and, and we'll feel more comfortable about it, but hopefully it's within the range that we've already promoted or, or advertised, right? Um, but in order for us to move into schematic design, because at that point we would have picked a site at the end of preferred schematic, we'll have a site and we'll have renovation addition or new construction. We're not saying it has to be a two story or a three story option, but um, the systems 
or I should say the ground source, if we are going to utilize ground source, that would be really important to know as we start developing the schematic design, because with there's so many implications to the ground source and where we place the school compared to the, you know, ground source, because that needs to be done and complete before. We, so, so if, does that, does that help? I mean, that's why we're asking just to have an answer and direction yes. by the end of PSR. That, that, that makes sense. I, I, I somehow didn't suspect we were needing to make a vote today, but I just wanted to make sure it was, it was clear that we're, we're going to give this conversation, give this topic a robust conversation, um, but still knowing we need to, to bring closure to it. Yes. And we will also have, so we submit our cost estimate information to the cost estimator in uh, mid-May. And he is, he or they, Aim Fogarty, will be costing both uh, air source and a ground source options. So, so that uh, hopefully will be a little more refined. Um, we have Steve Coffrin on the call with solar design as well. And, you know, every discussion, we're able to refine our costs a little bit more. And so the layout of the buildings are going to inform how energy efficient they are, how much energy we use. Therefore, we can, you know, and we can continue the conversation, whether it's a hybrid model of air source and ground source, whatever. But um, we will have some updated costs at the beginning of June. And I know we're going to have public, we're definitely going to want to have public input once we have the costs and, and more details on the options in June. So, Kathy? It just before I'm ready to um, bring, we have two hands in the public, but Donna, you just mentioned hybrid system. It would be probably useful for us to know whether um, those are more difficult to operate, you know, what are the pluses and minuses of thinking it that way? And I'm not asking for those answers now. So I'm just saying to put that into the equation of the subcommittee making a recommendation one way or the other, if we can keep everything open, that it could be hybrid. But um, at one point, someone told me, it might have been Margaret, that they're more complicated. If you've got more than one system operating in the building, it increases the complexity of running the building, but I just I don't I don't know again what the experience has been and how many places have even gone that route. So um, that would be one more piece of information, and I'm not sure how much money we save versus an all ground source. So I think for yeah, the people, right. I mean, there's you know again, as everyone has seen, and and because these are all preliminary and certain assumptions have needed to be made. But I think, I think everyone, we're all in agreement that a ground source utilizing something like a, a ACB is a more efficient building. Therefore you need less PV, whether it's on the roof or the canopies. Air source just isn't as efficient therefore you're going to need more PV. Now, maybe you can get more PV on the roof because it doesn't require as large of equipment, but, you know, so, so proportionately, right, um, there's, you can just see how both systems respond to the, incre the increase in energy or decrease in energy use or efficiency and how that translates to PV. So we're not going to have exact um, comparisons and, and we appreciate everyone's thoughtful. I mean, it's so wonderful to be working with such a group who truly understand it and you know are really trying to hone in on the details. But right now we don't have those details because we don't have a building because we don't have it, right? So, so comparatively though, I think we can demonstrate what a hybrid would look like and, and show you comparatively um, what that might look like that's from a cost perspective and then we can we have Samoon, we have Bamshi, we have others that could help explain the comp the complexities of having two systems okay Kelly yeah just a, a quick like general comment and this just is to go off of something Kathy was talking about earlier 
when you look at the cost difference between all four options that we're looking at right now, and you compare the difference between them to the energy savings over that same 50 years, you're talking about chump change, right? And that's why I think it's really important to show that and have it front and center as these decisions are being made, because to me, it's less about the difference in cost than it is about these issues of the user experience and the maintenance experience. So I just wanna put that out there just to help everyone to be kind of, you know, clear that we are really, you know, these costs are coming in very, very close relative to the overall savings. Yeah, could I say one more item is that, uh... Their source heat pump system is like a modular system. So the largest capacity is like 20 ton modules. So when you go from, let's say, 100% air source heat pump system to 80%, you save, let's say, 20%. Geothermal system is not necessary that way. The smaller it is, the higher cost per uh, ton it is. So when you go down from 100% uh, geothermal to 80%, you don't save 20%. You probably okay. save 10% or even less than that. Thank you. Thank you. So I, Jonathan, should I um, bring? Yes, let's 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 bring folks in and and just gonna remind folks that we'll try to answer as much as we can today, um, but some uh, some answers may have to come as more detail develops. So with that, Bruce, we can see you're coming in. And so Bruce, if, once you see that you're in, you have to um, unmute yourself. Um. Uh, I have no idea where I am yet. You are, <laughs> you are you. in you are in the room with us. You, we can okay. hear you. Good. Um, I thought Tim might continue on his uh, addressing some of the questions that were sent, um, but but he didn't, and, and maybe he he just uh, didn't get a chance to. Um, like Rudy, I've got a number of questions, but there's one question that really concerns me. And that's the, uh, uh, the, it relates to page five, is it, or six? Six. It's the EUI PV comparison. And as I understand it, well, frankly, I can't understand it. And that's my concern. It seems that there's a mistake there. Um, and I'm going to take you through my logic, which I did in the email, but I'll do it again, because I want to. I want, we, I want you to explain to me um, why I'm wrong, if I'm wrong. And if not, it would appear that some of the underlying assumptions here for costing and so forth are, um, are, are, are not based on the sound foundation. So I'm looking at the right-hand side of this, and I'm looking at the uh, EUI, which, by the way, are the whole building EUIs. We're not comparing the, um, the just the... Uh, the, the heating and cooling system EUIs. So, as I, so if I go back to February on a on a, a high performance building on a net zero building, uh, the way you broke it out was that 5.3 kilowatt hours per square foot per year of that 25, you've got 24.9, but that's the same more or less. 5.3 of that, which is you know about a quarter. Uh, sorry, about a, about twenty percent is apparently what would be dedicated to uh, uh, the load that is uh, attributed to the heating and cooling. So I go across to the center, uh, to to the uh, to the the air source heat pump column, and that EUI rises from twenty four point nine to thirty one point four. It's the same building. The only difference, as I understand it is that there is an air sourced heat pump heating and cooling system, not a ground source. So we attribute the difference of 6.4 or so of the EUI um, to the air sourced heat pump over the ground sourced heat pump. So that means that the, to my analysis, that means that the assumptions related to coefficient of performance of the ground sourced heat pump are over twice as high as the air source. Um, 
Now, my general understanding is that you'll get a coefficient of performance in the low twos for an air sourced heat pump and the high threes for a ground sourced heat pump. So that suggests it's about a two thirds differential, not 120%. So it's, so in that, thir that 31.4 really should be 28. And then all of the computations of PV that are required to carry the difference um, uh, would be different. And a lot of the numbers in the following charts would be different. So am I wrong? Why is it that the coefficient of performances are so widely different? Have you assumed that the coefficient of performance of a ground source heat pump is what I would say unreasonably high? Or have you assumed that the coefficient of performance of the air source heat pump is unreasonably low? It just doesn't make sense to me. And um, I would like you to address that now if you could, and I won't ask any more of the questions because none of the other questions I have is to me even half as consequential as this one. Yeah, Bruce, definitely I can take that um, address that question and you know if um, we need to dig a little bit deeper again we can have another conversation yep. so we did take a look at the spreadsheet you sent us so what we did is we kind of compared our analysis or our inputs so you're spot on in terms of uh, COP um, again we are talking about average coefficient of performance the yep. annual coefficient of performance not the rated conditions yes, so exactly. yes um, the one more thing added to this mix is it's not purely, the difference is not purely from COP alone. Um, it's also coming a little bit from the, um, the distribution system as well, how the air source heat pumps are delivered, delivering the heating and cooling. So there's a little bit of that. So that kind of reduces that gap that you're seeing uh, in terms of uh, the difference between COP um, for GSHP and ASHP, and so just, um, so yeah, you're comparing the device COP, and you're saying, uh, sorry, you're 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 uh, you're saying that my numbers are more accurate so far as the device COP is concerned, and you're saying, but of course we need to address the system COP, and you're saying if we address the system COPs, it the 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 variance is greater between air source heat pump and ground source heat pump because the air source heat pump systems demand more as well as their ability to connect and draw heat from the air. Is, is, do I understand that's what you're telling me? That's correct. Okay. When, when we actually, we went back into the model and kind of extract the data, because we run these analysis on hourly basis. So for each hour, depending on how the, if it's ground source heat pump, it will look at what is the incoming temperature of the water and how much load you have. And it calculates COP on hourly basis. So when we ran the average COP for the year, we were close to four on the geothermal system um, uh, and then uh, two COP for the air source uh, heat pump system. So it is roughly I'm talking about and I'm, I'm not giving you the, any decimals. So okay. so that is that is the first part. And the second part um, was the PV difference, right? In the same one, um, I remember you calculating the PV difference. Yes, so I did a math error there, as you can tell. It was not 109, it was 199. So not four times, but eight times. But again, predicated on my uh, understanding of your thing here. Yeah, so once we, we, once we adjusted for that uh, error, you know, it kind of comes to the same number we came up with. And again, we actually included some additional 50% capacity, uh, additional capacity for the PV system. Yep. Um, you know, accounting for system degradation that we'll adjust. Stephen from uh, Solar Design Associates is here who can chime in more um, since that presentation or since that numbers were put out, he had some thoughts on system degradation, will, which we'll address later on but also it gives us a little bit of buffer in case the usage moves up and down a little bit here and there. Yes, yeah, but I, that makes sense. Uh, Bruce, sorry, I, I just wanted to add, uh, we we'll look at your spreadsheet and um, your method is correct, but um, there was one tiny mistake that you um, times the, uh, you divided the COP instead of uh, 
should times it, and that's uh, where the majority of difference is from. But once we adjust that, and and your number is very very close to ours. I I think we need to talk about that, but we don't need to do it here. Um, uh, but anyway, that that at least gets me to the point where um, I, I'm I'm reassured. Thank you, thank you. I'm reassured that uh, what I first thought was incomprehensible is now comprehensible. And I also appreciate that this is very early. And really, what I was digging into was a was whether there was some oversight of some sort. And I know these will get refined and things will change or, well, refine and so forth. So I think that um, has, is um, clear enough for me now. Uh, the other question that I had, which is only one to, um, uh, I, I note that uh, on the very last page, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, we're, we're looking at the if you if you can go to the last page um, of the I can do it here actually the cost savings and comparisons and or it, maybe it's the second last page I beg your pardon I think it's oh hold on where am I oh no it is the last page sorry I wasn't scrolling down that's it yes um, very interesting to see the, uh, the, 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 the cost of electricity moving forward. And I understand the reasons why you say it and so forth. But the, down, down the bottom, you say the uh, electricity cost savings estimated at 90% of consumption. And I guess that's a rule of thumb thing. And it seemed to me that that was predicated on an almost complete use of the PV as generated going straight to the loads and therefore there would be very little um, purchase from the uh, very little of the of the PV production fed into the utility and and, and not so much com complementarily being purchased back so that this is the demand charges and all of those things for that purchased electricity which seems very small to me and um, and I I thought, oh, well, that's probably because this is almost all daylight hour operation. So I guess the question is, if and as if this building were to shift to um, have more functionality uh, in uh, non-daylight hours, which, for example, could be the a greater level of community use, which one could promise as a way of uh, selling this building to the community as a whole. Um, I guess I would understand that 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 those electricity costs, the marginal costs that you've got there, which are between seven and nine thousand dollars, would increase um, uh, um, if the uh, if the after hours use of this building increased. Um, you are correct, Bruce. That if the hours of use assumptions that we had in an earlier slide were to change, it, it would affect the energy performance. And and yes, the savings are predicated on uh, an exchange of, you know, producing power and getting credit for it when the building is not occupied. And then again, yeah. getting uh, energy from the grid when you're not producing as much and it all working out to be close to zero. Yeah. And, and I, I commend uh, Shelley's uh, thought uh, process uh, about the, uh, the bigger picture being the important picture on this, <laughs> although it'll be hard for us to uh, um, keep that constantly in mind because the immediate costs are the ones that we're probably going to have to defend. Um, but to the extent that we can shift the conversation to the bigger picture and do so with um, sound data and confidence and unilaterally um, uh, one mindset amongst the committee and people like me who are supporting the committee in town, then I think it's a, it's a good, uh, a good piece of counsel. Shelley, I appreciate that. I think that's, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you Bruce. Um, okay. Chris Riddle, I'm bringing you in and I've brought you in. So once you see something, you can unmute and talk. You're with us. You can hear me? Yes. Good. Um, 
First, I want to call everybody's attention to the words energy budget in the uh, zero energy bylaw. Um, we are uh, required by that bylaw to develop an energy budget um, early in the process and then to keep it updated throughout the process. Um, I, we sort of have an energy budget and that we have a 25 EUI target, but the, the intent there was that there would be maybe after the product of a, of a run of the, uh, of the energy model would produce a, a fairly detailed target uh, that we, we would use as a, um, as a, as a, as a target to uh, guide our guide our work and see how we're doing relative to that that energy budget. So just please look up the word energy budget in the zero energy bylaw and give me a sense for where we stand on that. Are we going to just rely on just so this 25 EUI or are we going to try to come up with a fairly detailed um, energy budget for the, the project? Secondly, um, under uh, I'm, I'm just repeating somewhat of what Bruce said that the um, schedule does not show any nighttime use, and I thought that we were going to add nighttime use back into that schedule, and based on an earlier discussion. Um, on under HVAC options, um, is am I right to say that energy recovery ventilation is only pro provided where it's indicated on that chart, and is that uh, and so that the, the the large users, the the gym and the cafeteria and those kinds of things do not get energy recovery ventilation. Am I reading that correctly or not? Um, what is the difference between ducted FCU, fan coil units, and AHU? I'm not understanding what that distinction is. I'd like to understand what ducted FCU and AHU mean. Um, are rooftop HVAC units contemplated? I hope they aren't, but I would like to know with an answer to that. Um, under kitchen, why is electric heat only in the air source heat pump option, not in the ground source heat pump option? Why is that? Um, does does duct ducted uh, FCU equal a VRF system? That's my question. Do we are we distributing we're 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 distributing free out refrigerant to those uh, units? Um, let's see. What is AHU served by ASHP? I guess I understand that. I guess that means that we are doing it. It's a hydronic system. It is heated and cooled by the air air source heat pump. Um, am I right to say that everything is going to be? Um, uh, hydronic, except for those things that are called ducted FCU? That's a question. I think, Chris, I thought we established that that wasn't right. Um, why is a chill beam only in the ground source heat pump option? That's a question. <clears throat> um, that's not the bicycle cost. I think it would be good for the life cycle cost to show a similar life cycle cost profile uh, for a uh, oil or gas system. So we can show that, that, that the boilers wear out too, and we have to replace them too, and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you sort of do that, but I think it would be good to see that over time. And... Nope, that's it. Thank you. Um, we can respond to those. I will. I will respond to the last part first. That was mentioned earlier that uh, there was a, a desire for a baseline, um, which would be a fossil fuel burning, so we could compare costs and savings. So uh, we will effort that, um, uh, and I will hand it over to Samoon to talk about spaces that are served by ERU uh, and the components of the fan coil first. You want me to start, Tim? Sure. Okay, I'll I'll see if I can remember all the list of questions that Chris has presented. I try to write down the best I can. So let me know if I missed anything. Uh, uh, one of the first question was: uh, Is ERV only in the chill beam area or not? Uh, actually, Energy Code dictates what areas I need to have ERV. 
So like uh, most recent IED, IE uh, conservation uh, code 2018 requires that even the air handling unit, depending on size and duration it operates, that does require partial energy recovery system for the ventilation portion. So that will be complied with. Uh, and second question was, uh, what is, why are we using ducted fan coil unit versus in the BRF option versus the um, chill beam, which is inside of building? There's two reasons. Uh, one is that chill beam is much quieter. So you can clean the space and still meet the uh, uh, modern standard of a learning environment acoustical requirement. And second reason is that most times when you do air source heat pump system, you use uh, ductless, in, uh, ductless units. And that's pretty good for like residents where you have a plenty of a dead space where draft doesn't really uh, sort of bother people. But in the case of classroom where it's highly dense, uh, densely occupied, you don't have any dead space where you could uh, throw this air. And if you ever set it set in front of a like, wall unit, pre-drafty where in the summer or winter time is constantly blowing right in front of it. So that's the second reason. Uh, third was, uh, uh, do we have any rooftop air handling units? Right now, conceptually, we are thinking about ERUs and air handling units to be uh, on the roof mounted. Um, we have done buildings where everything is inside, but that, that of course adds cost to the project. So that's something that uh, the design team has to evaluate. Kitchen exhaust, uh, kitchen system has an electric heating coil, not because of any other reason, but uh, uh, limitation of air source heat pump system. Air source heat pump system cannot tolerate any air that's colder than 24 degrees. It actually craps out. So I have to heat it up to 24 degrees before I could utilize air source heat pump system for further heating. And reason I don't have electric heating on other parts is because modern day air source heat pump system is rated to operate down to minus 13 degrees outside. Uh, in previous, let's say 10 years ago, when we were designing system, we always had a backup electric heating coil because Below zero degrees, it used to just not be able to perform at all. Uh, uh, when it comes to ducted VRF, uh, is the same as fan coil unit? Yes, indoor unit for the VRF portion, we are proposing uh, a ducted fan coil unit, and it gets its energy distributed by refrigerant piping. Uh, I think next one was, uh, is your thermal, thermal system all hydronic? Yes, it distributes at the uh, geothermal plant. It uh, produces chill water and hot water and distributes throughout the building. Uh, only difference in geothermal system is that it cannot produce hot water that's hotter than 125 degrees. So uh, the heating coils and the system has to be uh, designed such that you could utilize the low temperature water. <laughs> Uh, why is uh, chill beam in ground source heat pump option only? Uh, air source heat pump system is kind of limited in what you could do. They give you, you have outdoor unit and when it comes to distribution system, uh, you have a fan coil units or ductless fan coil unit which has certain amount of uh, noise uh, or set generation. So I can't really utilize without ducted system. And they don't have a chill beam option for the uh, VRF system. And when it comes to geothermal system, we do have a lot of options when it comes to distribution system, whether we use chill beam system, uh, a VAV system and all that. But uh, we have found, the, so far we have found the chill beam system to be most maintenance, low maintenance and quiet and trouble free. Did I miss anything, Chris? I think that's good. <laughs> I'm sorry, Simone, did you mention the kitchen? Yes. Okay, you did. sorry. Thanks, thanks, Simone. I think that's I think you said everything. I'm not sure, but I'll see I can watch it now. We can watch the recording. 
Okay. So one one thing that I think uh, we didn't talk about though was the um, the the daily, weekly, yearly kind of schedule. Um, Tim, could you bring that up just for a second? Um, so I, I know that Denisco uh, worked with the the uh, school to to kind of establish that, and maybe we should just quickly look at it again, um, and and maybe note, you know, I think this is probably based around kind of typical uh, daily and weekly use, and not necessarily that there there wouldn't be uh, special events that might be outside of these hours at times, but um, you know, if 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 changes to this were needed we would need to identify those very quickly because these these are guiding a lot of uh the uh the decisions that are are or the calculations that are being done at the moment um and so there there is some evening use but there isn't what i might call uh you know late evening use uh past the five thirty six o'clock kind of uh uh threshold on a regular basis Correct. And, and we can, I guess, circle, circle back or, or actually Rupert's on. So maybe Rupert wants to weigh in. Rupert. Sure. Um, uh, we do rent out spaces in various school buildings to town athletic groups, uh, gyms, particularly uh, throughout the year. And I would need to do, have a little time to sort of give a sense of what our current uh, rental um, frequency is, uh, but um, certainly usable gyms can be uh, quite sought after in the town by various athletic groups uh, up until nine o'clock at night. Um, uh, so uh, if it would be helpful, I can try to dredge up some information uh, for the team. I think that, that would be, be really helpful. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan. Yep. And, and then just to point out as well, um, you know, for summer use and right now, maybe, you know, it's that your existing buildings are being utilized in one way rather than when you have spaces that can accommodate air conditioning, et cetera. So what we have identified is that not only the core spaces such as the admin who's there year round, um, maybe even some of the, the cafeteria or the gym, which might be used for um, summer school, summer uh, fund programs or whatever, we're, we're also identifying in the summer that the classrooms are gonna be utilized as well uh, from 7.30 to 3 p.m. daily. And, are you going to use all of them? Um, maybe not. Maybe it's going to be the first floor. Maybe you only need 10, uh, 10 classrooms instead of the 30 classrooms. But um, if, if we, we appreciate this comment about use, because it, it's not only about, uh, you know, when each space is being used, but the other component that we've had to make an assumption on is the plug load. And for us, this is our biggest area of unknown and a little bit of our concern and in that we don't want to underestimate the plug load and the use of the school because that's going to inform you know the energy model but then we're coming back and measuring it to see how well we did afterwards as part of your bylaws so i don't know rupert you know thinking about plug load thinking about you know, the impacts now that everyone's on laptops, maybe we don't charge them all day. Like we've been trying to figure out how we can reduce the plug load in the schools, but we don't wanna underestimate now because we, we wanna make sure that we have the capacity to support the school going forward. So it's sort of a little bit of a conundrum right now. We wanna get it down as low as we can, but we don't wanna underestimate some of these. So. Maybe, maybe Rupert, um, we can maybe have a separate conversation with you that that would be, and maybe Mike or someone who's going to say no, you know, that we're all doing something one way, we can have a more informed decision on that. I don't know, Rupert and Kathy both have their hands up. Sorry, I, 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 I was babbling away, muted. Um, Rupert, did you want to follow up on that or, or should I go to Kathy first? 
I'll just say briefly, um, yes, I'd be happy to talk about plug loads. I think that probably the biggest variable that's going to affect how close we meet the models is going to depend on uh, occupant behavior, particularly around windows and ventilation. And I don't know how to figure that out. Kathy? Um, yeah, I just, when, when you had the conversation with Donna um, and Rupert, um, noting what you've done for the summer hours, you've got all parts of the building being used all summer. So it'd be good to, you may have done a very generous estimate for after hours already, but just to try to make that clear what's underneath that, because um, the buildings are not used right now that way um, all summer long. So uh, we may have underestimated the evening hours during the school year and overestimated the summer hours. So just getting some kind of balance between those before we uh, say we need a lot more solar panels because the building is going to be used all the time. And I understand this is all in a future looking way, because um, one can imagine a cafeteria with a stage will be used in a way that a cafeteria without a stage is not used now, but you've got the cafeteria being used um, all summer long every day of the week, oh, during weekdays. So I just think just, just getting some sort of balance when you look at those, um, and I have no idea how to do that. So that was I, just an observation. No, that's helpful. And I think um, we will circle back. This was, I think, um, Superintendent Morris's best guess on, on usage. And then, you know, Rupert, you can speak more to this, but I don't believe that they have assemblies that they utilize the cafetorium all the time. Those are sort of one-offs. So maybe we can generally state certain things like, 10 times out of the year or once a month or twice a month, the cafeterium will be utilized by the school in the evening, whatever. Um, and, and then we can talk more about if you have summer programs, even if they're camps or whatever that utilize the building, I think that's what was kind of accounted for here. But um, Rupert, if you're, you're amenable and Kath probably would love to listen in, why don't we see if we can schedule something with Superintendent Morris to, to fine tune these based on your observations and then what he's aware of. That would be really helpful. And I see that both Chris and Shelly have their hands up and I don't know which one was first. Uh, so I'll, I'll go with Shelly <laughs> and then Mr. Riddle. Thanks. So first, just a quick comment about user behavior. Um, really feedback loops is what it's all about. So we got to you know, make sure that there's mechanisms that the users in the building can see where their usage is at and have signals that trigger them to act in this way versus that way. So like on the opening windows, for example, one thing that I've seen in schools is you have a little green light that's next to the windows. And when it's okay to open the windows, the green light's on. And when it's not, you don't, right? Literally, you need things that, that make it that clear. So that's just a, a comment on that front. But the other thing that I saw in one of the... Um, public comments was asking about um, how to deal with COVID and ventilation and recirculating air in classrooms. So I just wanna put that out there for discussion as well and wonder a little bit about has the um, air display, displacement ventilation been considered for the delivery system. And I think you can do that with either geothermal or with air source heat pump, but just curious if, if that's been looked at. Um, Simone, uh, if, if we got to the, the questions that were submitted ahead of time, I was going to have Simone speak to that one because it's a general rather than design specific, and that's one that we could answer at this stage. But uh, Simone, can you speak to that for a bit? Yes. Uh, when it comes to COVID uh, uh, concerns, uh, both with the NISCO Associates, uh, the NISCO Design, we have consulted with the many school districts about these COVID concerns. Uh, there are two viable options uh, we have uh, available, which is HEPA filtration and the UVC spectrum lights. Uh, we have used both of them. And we also, I see that uh, Amherst has uh, adopted portable HEPA filter system, which is very, very effective. Various systems have a lot of different options. Uh, 
all HPC system uh, has some component of recirculation system, and some of them has uh, more flexibility when it comes to doing the measures. For example, if it's an air handling unit, you could put good, robust MERV 13 filters, which is about 50% effective against uh, virus laden particulates. Uh, you could also put a UVC light, which is 99% effective of destroying all the viruses. When you go to smaller units, uh, for example, fan coil units, they do sell MERV 13 filters, but it's not really, uh, they don't last too long. They get their ratings because they put a lot of static electricity charge there. So after a few days, it just becomes MERV 10 or 11. So I don't know if you want to invest too much money on that. And you can't use a UVC light on fan coil units because UV light degrades the internal filter, uh, what's that, the insulation system. So it just falls apart after a while. Uh, chill beam system, you cannot put any filter system at all. So you would have to use a portable filter system. And so when one kind of, sorry. One more item is that there was one more question about ERV system, uh, whether it is based on heat wheel or dual core reactivation system, they do have a small amount of a cross contamination. In order to address that, we, would, we could use a UVC light to make sure that uh, any contaminants will be destroyed. Just one follow-up comment about um, air displacement ventilation is the delivery system is the difference between that. It's, it's the air is being delivered really slow, high volume across the floor and then rising up and being returned high. And so the theory is that any germs coming off of people are then allowed to go through the vent, through whatever filtration system that you have before returning back to people, as opposed to when you're mixing in the room and then basically, if you're relying on mixing within the room to get to your temperature set points, then everyone's breathing everyone else's air. That's my understanding of the difference between those two. And so it, it matters which, which it is to see if your, your filtration system is actually yeah. going to be effective. Yeah, I've been doing this uh, HVAC engineering for like 43 years, too long probably, <laughs> but only uh, Directional and controllable airflow system is in the class 100 clean room where it's laminar flow conditions, where it's uh, unidirectional and uh, hospital operating rooms. Every place else, it just mixes all over the place. You may see presentation, graphic presentation, nice arrow going one direction, but it's not true. As a matter of fact, <laughs> first reported case where they said, uh, HPC system may have uh, caused us spread of the COVID was actually because it was in Asia and it was a wall ductless unit and the um, infected person was sitting right below the air conditioning unit and it was pushing all the air across the other room. So it was a nice way to spread it. In the case of a beautiful displacement ventilation, air does go across the room. So if you happen to have an infected person sitting right in front of the uh, displacement diffuser, everybody else will get it. So what I'm saying is uh, in practicality, HPA system, when somebody tells you this system is better because of an air circulation pattern, it's not believable. It's, it's impractical. So Kathy. Um in interest of, of keeping track of time and make sure yeah. we can cover as much territory as we right. can. Right, there, yeah, there are two more people wanting to come in. So yeah, Jonathan, so should I move to the next person then? Yes, but I wanna say well, one quick thing first, which yeah. is I, I know that Tim ha has given some consideration to some of the, the uh, questions that are, are uh, addressable at this time that came in ahead of time and I don't wanna miss that. And so um, I'm hoping that maybe we could, it's about, uh, 225 now, maybe at about quarter till or so, we could uh, kind of give Tim that opportunity to, to address some of those questions as well. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I will say that many of them have been covered, especially with that last uh, conversation that covered a lot. And obviously, uh, getting comments from the public is very important. But maybe we'll say we'll call it 250 then, just to, just to stop and pause, to make sure that if there's some 
some important ones that we haven't surfaced and, and talked about that we do that. Okay, thank you. Rudy, so, so yeah, Rudy's coming in. So Jonathan, just keep, so, um, so th that's a request that each of the next people try to be really focused as well. Yep. Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Rudy, yep. Rudy Perkins, uh, 42 Cherry Lane in Amherst. Um, maybe it's the lawyer in me. Um, sometimes likes to get things explained. Uh, piece by piece. So um, thank you for answering so many of the questions. I, my list is very short now, um, but I did want to come back to my top question about 108,000 uh, gross square foot figure for the reno ad. I still have not really heard um, a satisfactory explanation for why uh, that reno ad option can't be the same gross square footage approximately of 105,750 that you're using for the the new building, um, partly because it would give us an apples to apple comparison, partly because that's what the space summary uses. So I don't know how we could go outside that. Maybe there's leeway, I don't know. Um, and partly because obviously if we make bigger building, uh, we generally increase construction costs and operating costs. So I don't wanna see, um, for those reasons, I, I think whatever you can do to give us a 105,750 um, reno ad um, match that we can compare, that would be very helpful. You know, it's up to the committee whether they want you to spend that time doing that. But um, the things I would want to be sure you had looked at would be changing the dimensions of the interior courtyard and the reno portion. Um, changing the dimensions of what portion of the, the old building you actually preserved in the reno, um, selecting, uh, making the new addition smaller uh, to keep it at about the same size. And if needs be moving uh, room types around between the uh, reno uh, portion and the ad portion or some combination of those to try to get to a, a reno ad model that was more equivalent. Um, and there may be things that I just can't imagine that you guys have hit in the old building that with, you know, a few uh, diagrams of the layout of the building and where you can make cuts in the building where you can't um, might explain it. But uh, at some point, I, I think it would be very helpful to have that because obviously the 108,000 figure ripples through all of your your estimates on energy usage, at least it seems to, you've got to, you know, when you'd be doing that multiplication times whatever your EUI to get your energy usage and, the, and your PV needed. So um, when we're trying to shave off a percentage here and a percentage there, it seems like a worthwhile exercise to me. But so that's that's uh, one that I don't I don't really feel has been adequately answered yet. Um, you've um, sort of touched on why the GSP. GSHP HVAC number is um, higher than the ASHP number for just the a HVAC portion. I was a little puzzled by that, and I wondered if the chilled beam distribution was being included in that or some other costs that were pushing the GSHP option up beyond its just its um, GH, the wells cost. And that's on slide seven. On slide eight, I thought I heard you today confirm that maintenance cost equals neutral means there's about the same maintenance cost between the ASHP system and the GSHP system. And I wondered if that's what you were saying and if you've looked at the likely um, maintenance staff hours that would be used for each of the systems and how much you'd have to farm out to um, professional contract heating contractors for the maintenance and what the comparison is. Maybe it does come out Neutral. I don't know. I thought before you had said that it was different. Um, that I, I'm also interested in just how many servicing companies are in the area. If we went with a GSHP system, uh, that was always a problem with my manage the management people I worked with. They always thought, you know, we weren't taking into account the maintenance costs over the long haul with certain more highfalutin systems we put in, and I'm wondered whether there's adequate servicing on both a 24 seven basis and just generally in the area to service both types of systems. Um, and let's see, uh, 
I, I was confused by the CO2 emissions figure, but maybe you'll clear that out up in later uh, iterations of your um, your slides and explain that how much CO2 we're saving in the emissions. And then I think you've covered most of the sort of arcaniana about the ventilation systems, which I really appreciate because um, I heard a talk by uh, an air hygienist after COVID broke out who was saying, we looked at um, building systems for water and municipal systems for water purification and filtration after cholera outbreaks. And we basically got our systems good now, but we haven't done the same for air. And I appreciate that you're gonna be looking at airborne virus mitigation and how to set up the, the filtration and the different systems. I think we really need to pay attention to that now. And I appreciate that. So um, anyway, th I think you basically touched on all my other previous questions, unless there were some that Tim had an answer for that I didn't mention. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. Um, we can start to answer these, and, and actually that this will get to most of them. But uh, starting with the 108 gross, 108,000 gross square feet for a renovation addition, um, the sort of exercises that you've described, you know, truly evaluating um, which rooms get saved, which rooms go away, um, the size of the addition as it relates to the existing building are all things that we're going to study in detail going forward um, that we have, you know, started to look at, but we haven't gotten to the level of detail that would give us the certainty to say that we can get to 105, 750. And we might not be able to get to 105, 750. There are some inefficiencies inherent in using different shaped rooms in a different arrangement as part of your building than what you would do if you would start from scratch. Um, we may be able to get below um, 108, but that inefficiency is, is part of reusing a building um, and, and we will do everything we can to make it as efficient as possible, but that is that is part of the issue of using a good building. Um, and you are correct, if there are 3,000 more square feet of building, there are 3,000 more square feet to heat, cool, and uh, keep the lights on. So uh, all of this, uh, you know, we'll have in our minds as we move forward and study the options. Um, Tim, another thing you've just that occurs to me on that topic is that while there's some inefficiency, you also don't want to necessarily compromise the 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 programmable space to right. to make up for that. That you you're not gonna you don't want to take it out of the classrooms to be blunt about it. You know, if, yeah, if absolutely you've got a big U shaped corridor, for example. Yeah, we are not going to yeah yeah cut a quarter of a classroom out to hit that square footage target. That's you know we're going to build the school that serves the students uh, the you know the way it has to. Uh, and hey, sometimes the price you pay is a, a little extra space. Um, I just can I just add one thing there that I think helped make it clear to to the public is that a lot of that inefficiency is in the circulation space. And so what you're talking about is reducing programmable space in exchange to have the inefficient circulation space. And it's more than what people might normally assume. And I think that generally people wouldn't think about unless, you know, been an architect for a long time and dealing with these things. So just to kind of add a, another little comment there. Could I just touch on that maintenance cost differential? Uh, the VRF system uh, is a lighter duty construction. It's probably like light commercial duty. And based on my talk with uh, all the users, it does have higher maintenance. But when I started looking for the actual documentations, studies, I couldn't find anything. So as a default value, uh, I recommend that, that we just for now, uh, because of lack of information, that we just keep maintenance costs for both same. When it comes to how many uh, what's that, qualified contracts there are around here, I feel pretty good because you have a benefit of having so many higher education buildings around here. So mm -hmm. I would think mm -hmm. it is true, but I haven't done any survey to find out how many there are. Okay. 
You know, I just I would just add to that both UMass and Amherst College have ground source heat pumps in them. So we do, we don't just have higher education, but we have higher education that ha have included these systems in their systems, and we have some other buildings. So unless we're assuming that none of them are being maintained, there we're generating a market is the other way I would think about it. <laughs> if there if there isn't a good contractor here, there ought to be a good one because there's a lot of business for them. So. So not, should I bring the next person in, Jonathan? I'm just looking at your, and Rudy, did we get the big ones? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I just, um, if you do change this, the space of the building, aren't, aren't we gonna have to reassign space to the different program needs? And that, that's, an, that's a discussion I don't wanna go through again, but um, if you're in the ad reno and you've got extra room space, who's getting it? anyway okay. for down the line yeah well, um, just, sorry kathy go ahead no i just what just shelly was adding so i think that's a topic for a different yeah era than here but what shelly was saying is you still have to have hallways so if we're, we're keeping part of the whole building we still have to have a hallway in it we have to have doors that come in and out so there's a limit to how much we can massage that we have sure. to have we're putting the same classrooms in it, but that's that extra 50%. Where does it come from? <laughs> um, for, right. you know, so I think we should just leave that for a separate discussion, yeah. Donna, because. Yeah, um, yeah. I, think, I think it'll I think be just... all much clearer with floor. When you have your first pass at floor plans, I think this topic <laughs> will be easier to discuss and, and. Yeah, I just, I just, just from, from a programming perspective, um, the renovation addition or new construction will meet the educational program, no more and no less. And so again, as Shelley and Kathy um, both have said, it really just becomes efficiencies in the layouts as, as we are um, working with an existing building. So the, the program components are all gonna be there and we're not going to make them larger just because there's extra space. But uh, as Jonathan said, we're working with um, the school department actively to make sure that we understand completely what the adjacencies of the programs need to be. And then, and then we can lay it out as efficiently as possible while maintaining daylighting and all of that other stuff with the existing building. So those will be forthcoming at a building committee meeting shortly. Thanks. Kathy, let's see if we can bring in the last person who's got questions. So, um, Comments? Maria, um, I think I have brought you in. I am well, here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, um, I had a couple of questions about the assumptions that were listed in the the um, packet for today, um, and I believe I heard you say that. Three stories is not a done deal. So I think that, and that's two stories is also going to be studied for new construction. So I think that that should probably come out of the assumptions. And I think that is a good thing to understand the difference between two and three stories, not only from uh, just the side of the building, but specifically for net zero and for PV and that kind of stuff. So uh, a request to do that. Another uh, bunch of the assumptions was about the envelope. And you had some R values of 25 for wall and 40 for roof. And I'm wondering why you chose those. Um, in the Fort River feasibility study, when we were looking at doing an EIU 30, um, uh, uh, EUI, sorry, 30 uh, building, we looked at an R rating of 35 for the wall, so 10 higher, and 60 for the roof, so 20 higher there, with 15 at the slab. Uh, as opposed to the um, EUI for a, uh, an EUI 50 building, we were using something more akin to what these envelope values were, 25 and 30. So if you could explain that, that would be helpful. Um, and I did have a question about uh, for spaces that have uh, tall ceilings, so the gym and possibly the cafeteria, have you considered, um, uh, and if, I'm curious about floor radiant heating um, and just, why that would be good or not good, or is it not being considered? I'm curious about that. 
Thank you. Um, I'll take the first part and then distribute. Um, two stories for new is not off the table. Uh, the assumptions in the presentation is what was used to generate uh, the costs and operating costs for what has been presented and, and moving forward, working with the district to figure out what is the best in terms of education and all other things being considered. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Two stories is certainly still on the table. Um, and then I will start the uh, our value of the envelope and then hand off to Vamshi. But um, these are assemblies that we have used and they perform to get to our EUI targets, but they're is certainly more insulation that can be added, uh, but you get to the point where the cost of that extra insulation does not improve uh, performance to the effect that it's worth it. Uh, and I'll let Fang Shui follow up on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there are diminishing returns beyond certain point for sure. Um, and uh, I do agree that, you know, we haven't done the optimization that exercise is going to follow up later on. Uh, right now, what we are looking at is comparison of the systems. But as Tim has mentioned, you know, the 25 uh, value in the walls, you know, that may be bumped up on other zero net energy schools that we are working on. We are looking anywhere from 25 to 30. Again, the roof depends on, you know, the final massing option where we get if it's um, three stories where there's two stories and how the mousing is finally developed that can change because we want to um, see how much surface area we have of the roof and what is the optimum level. So we'll work on that piece. Uh, it's a really great question, uh, but we'll get there. For now, these are placeholders. Yeah, I also want to add, uh, it is because we have such high efficient energy, uh, it's efficient uh, systems, that uh, our heating and cooling is already very no low right now. It's uh, for our geo uh, ground source heat pumps um, version of the case. Uh, it's only 5.3 UI for heating and cooling, uh, which is about 20% of the total UI. So if we improve on that, um, it's going to be um, made more, and we see uh, diminishing returns, as um, I'm sure Wanti mentioned. And just a, a second comment on this, just for everyone's comfort level. These love these insulation levels are consistent with the ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guide for K through 12 schools. So, as a starting point, it's completely reasonable. Could I address that radiant floor issue? Okay. Uh, all of a sudden. Unlike uh, residential uh, buildings, we need to comply with a, a ventilation system. So you have to have an air system of some kind for the gyms. And a part of our job is to make the system uh, best value as possible. Uh, and radiant heating means I would have to have a radiant heating system plus the air system. So it would uh, increase the first cost uh, anyway. And uh, probably another item is that uh, modern day wood floor system in the gym is pretty sensitive. So I'm not really sure if I could get a uh, good performance uh, of a wood floor with the radiant floor in the commercial applications. That's something maybe Tim could address a little better. Um, that would require a little more detail and research than I'm uh, comfortable saying right now. I mean, I know the issues, um, there are issues of humidity warping, all sorts of things that can affect um, the quality performance of the gym floor, which we wouldn't want to interfere with by including, in, introducing the radiant heat below it. But um, the the reasons that Samoon mentioned are, are, are the driving factors here. I appreciate those answers. That was very helpful. Thank you. I think, I think that is um, it for, let me just double check. There are no other hands up. Uh, Jonathan, that concludes public. Great. Tim, were, did, were there any kind of last things that, 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 that you all had 
had an answer for that we didn't touch on. I don't think so, but I don't. I don't think so either. I mean, I have a list here, and all of my highlighted some I, items have been touched directly or indirectly. So, I mean, we will also um, keep a record of the questions that were asked. Uh, so, in addition to the recordings of the meetings, there's a written record of what was asked and answered, so that we can come back to it and refer to it if needed, or or to ask it again. But um, so. With that in mind, I think we have covered everything that we could hope to today. Great. Uh, just looking at my uh, agenda for the day, uh, we do not need to take a vote, that which would be the next item. Um, we have no items not anticipated uh, 48 hours before the meeting. Um, and so unless there are thought, last thoughts, questions, concerns on the part of the committee, um, I would uh, welcome a motion to adjourn. Oh, I see Rupert's hand. Well, I just have to take advantage of, of this uh, august group of uh, experiences and minds. Uh, with I just had a, a quick question about um, the uh, uh, displaced ventilation system. I've read about it. I've never experienced it. I worry that it um, about comfort levels uh, with uh, cooling air being introduced down low. Um, and I just wonder if anybody has any comments. Thank you. Yeah, we what we are asked on almost every school system to evaluate it and I spent a lot of time with uh, lunch and learn visiting looking at design documents and it's too delicate for my liking is that if you look at it you're supposed to introduce a uh, loop cool air in the ground level sweep it across and as it hits the a person which is it creates thermal plume which takes a little while to uh, was it uh, create, and I'm not really sure how successful you are to get ask a ten year old to stand in one spot enough so that it will form. form. Uh, it's too delicate. Uh, I like to stay with the system that's been proven for quite a while. So, Moon, with that, is is there any energy savings? Is it is it more efficient than an Air, you know, an active chill beam, or is it less efficient? I, I mean, if, if we want to look at it in the context of this group. It's something that I think Vamshit should, should uh, answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't see a lot of energy benefit from it. Um, definitely, there is benefit when you have high volume spaces where displacement ventilation um, really works well is because of the destratification. So you're supplying cooler air closer to the occupants rather than conditioning the whole volume. And in classrooms, we don't have that high volume of space. So you don't get that benefit of the destratification using displacement ventilation. So from energy performance perspective, um, it's pretty much neutral. So, so Jonathan, I'm ready to adjourn. I just want to say a big thanks. I mean, I, I appreciate the answers and I appreciate the willingness to take very detailed technical questions from people who are in total support of this project. So it's, it's an effort to both learn more and understand thinking. Um, I, I just found this to be an excellent session. So um, thank you all very much. And we look forward to seeing you again whenever is the right time um, for you to, to get um, a recommendation as we think about the information that we've got. So thank you. Great. Donna, did you have a last Yeah, I was, just, I was just gonna say, um, we too, Kathy, sincerely appreciate everyone's um, input in, into this, a wonderful project that is going to be the first net zero building in, in the town of Amherst. And your thoughtful comments are really help us think through everything and make sure we're not missing anything. I wish we could have all the answers today, but you know, the design process is iterative. So uh, unfortunately we can't, but we really appreciate your patience. And as we work through these, along with the program, along with the site along with, right? So um, we will hope to be before you um, sooner rather than later, although we need to do a little work in the design phase to be able to respond to some of the questions, but we don't have an enormous amount of time left, right? June is gonna be here 
sooner than well hopefully sooner because it still feels like it's winter but um soon, sooner than 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 you know we want from a work perspective but this has been very helpful rupert we're gonna we're gonna get with you we we have to work on plug loads we've got a whole bunch of other things that we can be working on while we're trying to refine the design so thank you all You're welcome uh uh, so Kathy, we should probably uh, do the, the proper thing and, and I'll ask again for a motion to adjourn. I make, I make a, a motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> I second it. I second it. <laughs> and, and with that, uh, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank Have you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>